From being a minority sport, golf is now very popular, with membership at most clubs fully subscribed. Whilst this is good for the sport, it does bring its own problem of wear and tear on the greens. On many courses, greens were constructed between 1870 and 1930 to cater for the moderate requirements of that period. But nowadays, greens are expected to be in play all the year round. This increased use can lead to compaction, poor drainage and thatch accumulation which could result in annual meadow grass ingress. A potential remedy could be to modify the existing fertilizer, irrigation and aeration program. Aeration could include any or all of the following. Hollow coring, verti draining, mole plowing and slit tining. However, if problems still exist after modifying the management program for some time, then reconstruction of the green should be seriously considered. The aim must be to produce a surface which will perform and sustain play over a 12-month period. And to this end, the USGA method of green construction has proved to be effective. Quality of materials and methods used are critical and expert advice should be taken before embarking on a project. The Sports Turf Research Institute operate laboratories where tests of all materials can be carried out and advice sought as to any amendments to either materials or procedures necessary to accommodate variations in ground conditions on individual courses. Now a graphical illustration of the reconstruction of a green to the USGA method. Here is a green before reconstruction, in cross-section and in plan. The turf is stripped from the surface and the immediate surrounds of the green. The green itself is then excavated to a depth of 450 millimetres below intended finished levels with the excavated materials being discarded. The sub-base is then shaped to mirror the intended contours of the finished surface and level stakes introduced. This allows for the imported materials to be laid to uniform depths. A drainage system is next introduced and a herringbone layout is ideal for most ground conditions. The main drain is laid directly down the main fall with the laterals at five meter centers. An alternative option is best suited to ground conditions where there is a runoff from higher adjacent ground. The main drain is laid round the edge of the green with laterals again at five meter centers. In both options, the drainage system is laid in a network of trenches 200 millimeters deep with a uniform fall of at least one in 200. The pipes are laid in the base of the trench, which is then backfilled to the subsurface with approved gravel. This shows the drains in place and trenches backfilled. The green is built up by first introducing a 100 mm minimum firm depth of the same gravel used to backfill the drainage trenches. This is followed by a 50 mm minimum firm depth of blinding material. Next, a 300 mm minimum firm depth of root zone is laid onto the blinding material. The quality and depth of all materials are extremely important. Finally, the surface is prepared for either seeding or turfing. Seeding should always be the preferred option, but few golf clubs are in the position to be able to wait the required length of time to achieve establishment, which could be in the region of 18 months. The advantage of turfing means the green will be playable more quickly. If turfing is the choice, there are several alternatives. Using existing turf. Possible advantages. The green will have similar characteristics to the original. The turf is older and should wear better. However, the turf may be of poor quality. 
there is a danger of an excessive amount of annual meadow grass. Using turf from an external supplier. Possible advantages. Guaranteed quality. Wide choice of grass cultivars available. Further quantities are readily available. However, turf is grown on different subsurface materials. The turf will probably be young. There will be variation in character between new and old greens. Using turf from an on-course nursery. Possible advantages. Control of quality. Turf is grown in a local environment. The turf may be older and more tolerant to wear. However, the golf course must have the space and the labour available. This video now shows a green reconstruction at Shipley Golf Club, relaying the existing turf. Work commenced during autumn to ensure a period before winter for the turf to develop. The first test cut is made and approved by the head greenkeeper. A new blade has been fitted to the turf cutter to ensure that the turves are cut as thin as possible. This means that most of the thatch at the base of the turf is left behind. The outer edge turves are rolled ready to be stored. Evidence of hollow tining and top dressing can be seen. On the rolled turves are hollow tine marks and previous slip tining cuts. When all the turf has been cut, the next task is to check the levels of the existing green, as the plan is to reconstruct levels more or less as before. The head greenkeeper duly notes the measurements. The rolling and lifting of the turf commences, using a small army of casual workers to supplement the green staff. This is carried out under the head greenkeeper's supervision, like a military operation. After loading, the turf is taken to a flat area nearby, where large polythene sheets are laid out to receive it. Polythene sheeting is ideal for this purpose, provided the turves are not allowed to overlap. In the event of dry weather, it is easy to keep the turf watered. Using this method avoids the risk of turves temporarily rooting into the ground. The route to be used by traffic is clearly defined. Lines are marked to indicate the outline of the original green. The presence of irrigation pipe work and where the trenches are to be dug to receive the level stakes. The first trench is excavated to accept the level stakes. The problem with this green can now be seen. A sample of the top 75 millimetres of root zone show the thatch on the surface. There is evidence of previous slitting, but the area between the slits is badly compacted, preventing the passage of moisture and restricting healthy root development. A further sample contains a previous hollow tine full of sandy top dressing and root growth. The first level stake is hammered home to the required depth. The excavated material is loaded onto trailers for removal. Two trenches for lines of level posts have been excavated and the area between has been cleared. Another stake is being put in and carefully lined up with the edge of the old green. With the excavation nearly finished, the sub-base is shaped and consolidated to mirror the finished surface required. Once this has been achieved, drain trench excavation commences. A good working understanding between the digger driver and the green staff checking the levels is essential. Great care is taken to ensure the correct fall in level on all the drain lines. To prevent damage to the drainage pipes and to ensure a consistent fall, a small quantity of gravel is placed in the bottom of the trench before introducing the piping. Perforated plastic pipes are preferred. 
110 mm diameter for the main drain and 80 mm for the laterals. The view inside the pipe shows the perforations which allow moisture to drain through. A length is now being unrolled, ready to lay in one of the prepared trenches. First, a cap is placed over the end, and the length is laid in the base of the trench. Some gravel is placed over the end of the pipe to stop it moving. Then, the trench is filled up to sub-base level. Whilst this is happening, the various lateral drains are being joined together to form a complete system, ready to feed into the main drain. Modern plastic pipes and fittings simplify this task. The joints are held in position by stones, before being covered with gravel up to sub-base level. A clean finish with uncontaminated material is essential. Overfilling the trenches is better than underfilling to prevent possible collapse. The trench for the main outlet drain is being excavated, ready to receive a length of 110 mm perforated plastic pipe, which is taken to a nearby positive outfall. A 100 mm minimum firm depth of gravel is being laid on the firm, clean sub base and a mini excavator is used to spread and firm the gravel to the approximate depth. It is important at this stage to work from the applied gravel avoiding the drain lines where possible. The last few loads of gravel are now being tipped in order to complete the gravel layer, which is raked smooth and leveled to the black bands on the level stakes. The blinding material is applied on top of the gravel layer. The approved material is placed cleanly to a minimum firm depth of 50 millimetres or to the white band on the level stakes. Once the binding layer has been completed, the transporting of the root zone mixture can begin. The small excavator is used to spread and firm the mixture, with care being taken not to disturb the level stakes. The root zone is placed in shallow layers of not more than 100 millimetres in depth and these individual layers are then firmed prior to another layer being applied. Layers are applied until a minimum firm depth of 300 millimetres is achieved over the surface of the green. Eventually, the required depth of root zone material is achieved. The final healing, treading and raking of the surface continues until the task is finished to the satisfaction of the head greenkeeper and the root zone reaches the green mark on the level stakes. A light application of pre-turfing fertilizer is now made, which in turn is lightly raked into the surface and the green is ready to accept the turf. Well, don't stand on soil, Chris. Come off soil. The first turf goes down with a warning from the foreman not to tread on the raked surface. The outer edge turves are then relayed. The outline of the green is now apparent, with the turves being laid with an overlap. The polythene sheeting under the turf shows how wet the weather has been but the retained moisture has benefited the turf during its short storage. As turf laying proceeds, there is a requirement to use turfing boards to avoid foot pressure damage. This is particularly important where a wheelbarrow is being used, in order to prevent damage from the legs of the barrow. Turfing continues until most of the turf has been laid and the green is nearing completion. As soon as the turfing is finished, the green is given a thorough brushing using French heather brooms. Any obvious uneven areas are attended to by lifting the turf and adjusting the root zone mixture below. This operation is carried out with great care and attention. Turves are firmed down smooth using a turf beater. Localised work of this nature is sometimes required to ensure a smooth surface before the whole area is top dressed with the root zone mixture.
The top dressing is smoothed over using a drag mat, which ensures that all spaces between the turves are properly filled. Finally, the whole green is brushed to work the top dressing into the base of the turf. Once again, the French heather brooms are used. The green is now left to settle until the spring. Next year, following a long rest during winter, appropriate fertilizer applications and regular top dressings are required to produce a smooth surface in time for opening play. As surface levels improve and the grass begins to grow, the height of cut is gradually reduced for play to commence. Some important points to remember. 1. Prior organization and planning is essential. 2. Quality of materials and methods are critical. 3. Complete the works without delay. 4. Avoid working in wet conditions. 5. Resist the temptation to open the green too quickly. And 6. Take care with subsequent management. During summer, the green is performing well, but it will be in the winter months when the benefits of reconstruction will be most apparent.